Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending the session today. Um, the way we're going to organize the session is um, as follows. We're going to start with an introduction. Then I will dive into the details of the standard prov. I then talk about provenance and its applications. And then we'll have a session which is more hands-on, uh, which is about modeling using provenance. Um, the context is, is this. Um, we are surrounded by devices capturing data everywhere. We've got AI techniques, automated algorithms making decisions all the time. Um, and we want to understand what's happening. Okay? Um, and in particular, we want to understand which data may have influenced decisions, which data have influenced a machine learning pipeline. We are interested in that as potential data scientists, but we are interested in that as an end user. Um, and there is a lot of movement around that, uh, this notion of accountability, uh, the ability of explaining what um, a system is doing. Um, and if you are familiar, the ACM is a worldwide association for computer scientists. Um, a year ago, it, its US chapter published a statement on algorithmic um, accountability and transparency. And they listed seven principles. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, worth mentioning that one of them is explicitly data provenance, number five. And then if you read the others, like number three, accountability, number four, explanation, number six, auditability, these are all concepts that relate the notion of provenance that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and as a researcher, I've got a question. The question is, well, systems, you know, computer systems have existed for uh, 50 odd years now. It has always been um, the aspiration to make them faster and faster and, do, and get them better to do things. We've never had a focus on getting them to explain what they do. It's only recently that we started doing that. Okay? So algorithmic solutions, from my point of view, should be better at explaining what they do, at explaining their behaviors. And under that heading, there are several things I'm interested in. Can we understand the behavior of the systems? Can we understand its common patterns? Can we understand its outliers? Can we understand what leads to decisions? Um, can we explain what the systems does? And um, what is an explanation, in fact? And even if we log a, lo a lot of data about systems, can we use that information in order to gain insights about the system and potentially predict what the behavior of the system is going to be? And all those research questions, I'm tackling them with this notion of provenance. So that's, that's the big pitch. Now I'm going to start with uh, an introduction to provenance. And for me, this started uh, nearly 15 years ago, um, I was in part of an e-science program in the UK. We were designing the first workflows uh, for bioinformaticians bio in particular. And then we had a question, what is the equivalent of the logbook for the scientists operating in that kind of environment? That's when we started discussing the notion of provenance. And at the time, provenance was only used in two different contexts. For food, you like to talk about a food coming from a specific region because it's very good there. And also in the context of art, if you go to uh, an auction um, with a piece of art, you would typically have some paperwork, the evidence, the various certificates associated with that piece of art. That's called the provenance. Full provenance for a piece of art proves the authenticity of the piece of art, therefore gives value to the piece of art. Well, at the time, we had nothing equivalent for data. Okay? Um, 
Now, a lot of things have changed since then. And if you look at that quote, it says, good curation demands good provenance. Provenance is no longer merely the nicety of artists, academies, and wine makers or food producers. It is an ethic that we expect, OK? And that has really changed over the years. Um, so what do I mean by provenance? On the left-hand side, you've got the dictionary definition. It's the source, that's the origin of something. On the right-hand side, oh, sorry, sensitive cable. On the right-hand side, um, we've got the definition that we came up with during the standardization activity. As Bart said, I led a standardization activity at the World Wide Web Consortium. The standard we defined is called PROV, and the definition of provenance is this one. It's a record. So that's something that you can store in a computer system that you can exchange, and that record provides a description of people, organizations, activities, uh, entities, um, data that may have influenced a piece of data, a data set, a document, a decision, or something uh, that is physical. You can talk about the provenance of these glasses, okay? <clears throat> Let me give you an example of how those principles that we standardize at the World Wide Web Consortium can be deployed in a real application. The National Climate Assessment Report is a series of reports produced by the US government. They produce every four or five years a report like this. Um, the last edition in, it was 2018. Um, the previous one was in 2014. And in 2014, they decided to provenance enable that report. That means that, well, not only if you've got a PDF version of the report, but also you've got a version that is online, that is browsable, and that is based on an information model called the Global Change Information Systems. And that information model is based, or in part based, on the standards that we defined at the W3C PROV. And let me show you an example of how it manifests itself. You can see here a page that is showing uh, a change of temperature across the US. What it is doesn't really matter. Um, what is interesting is that uh, there is a narrative around that image, okay? And in particular, it is telling us that that image was derived from a given data set. You can click on the link and find out about that data set. And it was derived from a data set by uh, using a process. Again, you can click on that link and find out about that process. Now, at the bottom, you can see here that you've got a number of links that you can click on. You can sh get machine processable representation of that narrative. And I'm giving you here just an extract of it. The extract is giving you the URI of this page, that image, okay? And it's telling us that it was generated by a process. You can have the link to that process, and it was derived from a data set. These terms are some of the terms that we standardize at the W3C. So let me talk about PROV. So we set up this working group back in 2011, and it ran for two years till 2013 for a standardization activity that's quite rapid. I'm going to say well, that's long, but I can assure you that's quite rapid. Um, and we had a mission which was to support the widespread publication or, and use of provenance of web documents, data, and resources. And the aim was to define um, uh, a language to exchange provenance in, um, information. So that's that record that I was talking about. Out of the standardization activity, we produced a number of documents. Um, four of these are called recommendations. In other standardization bodies, they would be called standards, okay? And others are called nodes. They, are, they don't go through the same 
rigorous process of proving interoperability, but they're still very valuable. Um, what we did is that we decided to design the, 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 the provenance data model as a conceptual model. That's what we call ProvDM, the provenance data model. And then we mapped that conceptual model to various technologies. We mapped it to XML, because XML at the time was still uh, trendy. We mapped it to RDF, so that you can uh, create resource descriptions in Prov. We mapped it also to JSON, though that's not something we did it in the working group. We did that outside. Dong, who's here, led that activity. I'm going to give you the 101 introduction to Prov, just one slide. There are only three concepts in Prov. A notion of entity, a notion of activity, and a notion of agent. An entity may be a piece of information, can be a data set, can be a document, it can be a decision. You're interested in machine learning, it could be a training set, it could be a model that is being built through training. Okay? Activities are things that are happening. Okay? You can plan activities, you can monitor something, you can vote, you can write a document, you can report on a situation, you can train a model, you can classify, okay? And then there are agents. Agents can be people, they can be services, they can be systems, they can be organizations, or they can be a combination of those. And then those three concepts, we're going to relate them through a number of relations. At the top of the picture here, you can see that an entity was derived from another entity. That's what I showed earlier because I had that image with change of temperature was derived from a data set. So that description is capturing the idea that you have a flow of data in your system or you have got a physical flow of things. You could talk about the transport of um, banknotes from a bank to a vault, whatever. Okay? Um, <clears throat> that captures flows of data or things in the system. Activities, they may generate entities or they may use entities. So very much you've got a relation of input and outputs between entities and activities. So with activities, you can capture a process view of a system. And then agents are there to talk about responsibility. You may say that an agent was associated with an activity, or an agent was associated to an entity because it was the owner uh, of that entity, or maybe an agent may be acting uh, uh, on behalf of another agent. Uh, and that, with that, we capture responsibility. So that's the basic vocab vocabulary that we uh, define. You're going to say it took two years to reach that? Yes, that's what it needs in order to reach a consensus between, uh, within a community. We had about 50 participants to the table. That said, there are a few more details in the standards. So what I want to do now is show you through a little example how provenance can be put in practice. Um, and I'm going to do that over an application that Dong and other colleagues developed. It's a crowdsourcing application. Um, we got the crowds involved in crowdsourcing evacuation routes. You're going to say, why did you do that? Well, we were working with the local authority in order to, um, to help them manage a situation where you, there would be an incident and we needed to evacuate populations. And they had no idea which direction, which route people would take in order to ev evacuate that area. So we, we built up that application and we made it provenance aware. Let me show you how it works. Um, so on, oh, there is something that doesn't work here. The animation has disappeared. Okay. Uh, it has really disappeared. So what you see here is um, 
a, a Google Earth view, um, and a user is asked to identify a building. The way they do it is just by drawing that building over the, that image. So in terms of provenance, there is a building that is created, that's an entity. There was a user. There was an activity which was identifying a building. And then they relied on a map at that point or that image. Okay. You know in crowdsourcing, you invite people to do something. You get other people to check it. Okay. Um, and the way we do that is, again, by bringing a user and they're going to uh, check whether the building is properly drawn. So um, we do that through a scoring activity resulting in a score. Uh, we've got a new user, and it was operating on the building that was drawn on the previous slide. Okay? And you check that with a number of people, and then you decide, OK, that building was good. We accept it. The next step is that we get um, somebody to draw evacuation routes. And for that, they've got a view of the building, and then they draw the evacuation route between the building and the local road or path. Okay? In terms of provenance, we've got two routes that were produced, two entities. There is a drawing activity operating uh, as an input on the building that was previously accepted, and this is another user. And then again, crowdsourcing, we need to check the work that was done, so we, we are going to have a scoring function, and we do that through a voting. We get other users to vote on the root set to say, OK, it's good quality. No, it's not good quality. And we use majority voting to decide whether we accept or not um, the, um, uh, the root set. So in total, we've got this full workflow. Um, and if I collapse it in this page, that is showing us the history of that root set. Okay? That's the provenance of that root set expressed using prov. And that is exactly. Um, what the website that I showed earlier with the National uh, Climate Assessment Report is doing, is making provenance available to its end users built on this data model. Okay? So what we have here, it's a standardized vocabulary. And that's, that's something that is quite important. It's to have a standard, because we need people to share provenance, and it needs to link up together, and it needs to be standardized. We can talk about flow of data, of processes, and responsibility, and it allows you, with that form of metadata, to enrich existing system uh, with a description of the origin of data. And I believe it's a huge step towards accountability, and you will see some of the things that we do with that uh, later. But before uh, going ahead, I'd like to um, go into the details of PROV. So if I go back to my uh, original slide, um, I should have prepared that better, have a reminder of the plan. I've now given you uh, an introduction to provenance, and now I would like to spend a bit of time talking about PROV in more details. So I'm using another deck for this. <coughs> um, and I'm going to base my, my presentation on, on an example. Uh, and then I will s try to convey some of the ideas around the standards, how this was structured and organized. Um, and then depending on time, I will talk about recipes or not. So first, this is a tutorial, but there is a lot of material online. Um, um, on the right-hand side of that slide, you see um, a primer 
that we produced at the W3C, describing the model intuitively. There is an ontology that we call uh, Provo, and there is the provenance data model, the conceptual data model, ProvDM. And in addition, um, I and a, a colleague, Paul Groth, have written a book, but it's a short book. It's not a massive book of 500 pages. It's about 120 pages, so it's, it's quite manageable. And it summarizes um, many of the things that I'm going to talk about today. In that book, we've got an example of an application. It's a data journalism application. Let me try and explain that scenario. We've got um, an organization called No News. No News publishes articles. Okay, and it's, they decided to have an article on employment data that was just published by the local government. Okay, so they are going to produce an article. In that article, there's going to be some plots derived from a data set, and the data set was published by that government agency, GovStat. Um, and in their um, article, they may refer other sources as well. There is a second organization, policy.org, that compiles a report including lots of articles, and in particular, they include the no news report. And then within no news, well, we do have a number of people involved. So we've got a data scientist, we've got a journalist, uh, Alice is a data scientist, uh, Bob is the journalist, there is uh, an editor term and there's a webmaster who ultimately publishes the specification called Nick. And out of this scenario, we have provided a number of use cases. In the presentation today, I will not go through all of them. Uh, they are, however, part of the, um, the deck of slides. Uh, they've simply been hidden for the purpose of the presentation. You can go through them. They are also part of the book that I was referring to. Um, we've got four types of use cases. Use cases talking about quality assessment, use cases talking about compliance, cataloging, and replay. Now, those use cases, we call them provenance use cases, because these, they talk about functionality that a user may want and functionality that you can implement easily if you have provenance. Um, <clears throat> in terms of quality assessment, um, I'm going to give you an example, which is the timeliness of data. So policy.org is going to publish their report. They've got a policy that is to ensure that they publish data that is up to date. And for that, they want to ensure that any data set referred to in the articles they publish are up to date. Well, it's quite challenging to do if you don't have support for that, because that would require policy.org to find out, to realize that there is some images included, the some plots included in the article produced by No News, and that image or that plot was derived from a data set published by the government. And they would have an obligation to ensure that this is the latest data set. You can't do that without having provenance. Or what you have to do is pick up the phone and talk to Bob or Alice to understand which data set they used and so on and so on. That is not scalable. You can't automate the process. Okay? Um, so without provenance, you can't do that automatically. Uh, when we wrote the book and when we designed those use cases, it, it was before the, the term fake news was uh, popular. Um, so uh, what we thought is that it, it's quite important to be able to decide whether you can trust a data source. And at the time, we thought that, well, 
you may decide that you can trust government in terms of publishing the right thing. Maybe we would revise the, the use case in version two of the, the, the book, okay? But in order to do that, again, it's not easy. You need to understand that there was a data set used in order to produce the article. You need to understand what the source is, what the author is, and that is the government. And then you have a policy to decide whether you can trust or not data produced by that organization. Okay? Again, without provenance support, it's something very difficult to do. Um, in terms of the other use cases, uh, you may want uh, under the heading uh, compliance, you may want to check whether the processes you followed in order to reach an outcome are compatible with your own policies. Okay? You may have policies, but you know policies can be documents that you put in a, drawer, uh, in a drawer and you never go back to. No, can we use them effectively to check what we do in practice? You may also want to go back to the various data sets, the various software that you use potentially to understand which license they come with, whether the license is compatible with what you're going to do with the result. Okay? It's quite hard to do without provenance or support for that. Very often you want to build an index of items you relied on, or maybe have acknowledgements for the various contributors to a piece of work, and it's really hard to do that transitively without provenance. And you may also want to replay some workflow. You may have uh, an execution that, that gave a result, and you're not quite sure why it is like that, but you would like to, do, to replay based on, on actually what happened, so that you can check whether this is right or not. All these are examples of uh, provenance use cases. We detail them in the book or in the, sli uh, in, the deck, um, in the slide deck. So let me show you how we can model provenance for that example. Well, no news produced an article, an employment article. We can describe that by the fact that there is an, an entity, which is the no news article. And there is an agent, which is, uh, so, sorry, no news produced an article, and specifically the author, the journalist, was Bob. So there is an agent who is Bob. And then you connect those two concepts by a relation that we call the attribution relation. So we're going to write that we had an article. It's referred to by its URI that identifies it on the web. And then it was attributed to Bob, the journalist. You may notice that all the relations that we used use the past tense. Um, it's a design decision when we named them. We decided to use the past ten tense to insist on the fact that provenance is about describing what happened in the past as opposed to describing what may happen hypothetically in the future. So provenance is not a workflow language, it's a description language for what happened in the past. Now, that article was derived from a data set, okay? Um, and we can uh, express that by the derivation relation was derived from indirectly from the data set, the concept of derivation. Uh, and as I said, the no news article was inserted in the report uh, published by policy.org. So we can have chains of derivation. Policy, the, the report published by policy.org included the article, it's a derivation, and the article was based on the data set. And then we can talk about the process of producing an article. So that would be an activity, um, the activity of writing an article. And then I've got two further relations here. The article was generated by this activity. So the output, the outcome of writing an article is, uh, of, of, of a writing activity is the article. And the uh, writing activity relied on the data set. 
And then when we have an activity, we can add extra information. In particular, we can indicate when it started, when it ended. This type of metadata can be very important in some use cases. So step by step, the scenario that I described earlier, you can um, document it with provenance. Okay? And when you do it, you get something like that. <coughs> I don't expect you to be able to see that, but we've got the organization No News, we've got, um, we've got Bob and Alice, um, Alice who generated the plot, Bob who wrote the article, we've got policy.org who inserted the article in their, uh, in their uh, final report. All the details have been expressed here. Very much like the un underpinning data model that you've seen in the National Climate uh, Assessment Report published by the US government. Let me talk a bit about the standard, how we went about standardizing um, and uh, defining some of the concepts. So, um, I've already presented that slide earlier, I don't need to repeat. It was a two-year uh, uh, long activity. We produced a family of specifications. And the key thing, and that's what I'm mostly going to talk about now, we've got this conceptual data model, ProfDM for data model. And then that conceptual data model, we map it to different technologies. And I think that's, that's the key thing. This concept of provenance should be independent of any technology stack. Because in reality, in most systems, data is going to flow across multiple systems using multiple technologies. So that's a key driver for this approach to standardization. Um, I've already spoken about the three core classes earlier and the three views of provenance, data flow, process flow, and responsibility. Now, some of us may be more software engineering minded. There is a notation called UML, uh, and here it's a UML uh, class diagram, but essentially uh, showing those three concepts that I mentioned and those associations. Now, let me tell you, let me explain you how we structured PROV. Ultimately, PROV has got about 17 relation, three top level classes, and probably six, seven uh, subclasses of these. And if you take the description of each, well, it's becoming long. So we needed to put some structure around that. And we organize the standards into several components. So we can, we've got the first core components with entities and activities. We've got another component with derivations. And then we've got a third component with agents and responsibility. These are the three views that I mentioned earlier. And in fact, this forms the core of the data model, okay? Um, there are a few more concepts that are more advanced, a notion of bundle, notion of alternate, notion of collections. I don't have time to go through them in this short tutorial today. So what you see in this slide is that we've got the three views in the core of the data model, and then there are extensions. So let me talk about a couple of those components, the basic ones. The first one is talking about entities and activities. Just a question here, who is familiar with the UML notation? Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, half of you, okay. Um, so here it's a UML diagram, class diagram. In the yellow box here, this is really the, 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 the core part of that component. So we've got the two concepts that I mentioned earlier, entity and activity, and associations. 
an entity was generated by an activity or an activity used an entity. Okay? These are the basic building blocks. And then we can enrich them with, with more things. Um, in particular, there are other relations. Uh, you can talk about the start and the end of an activity. They will become relation. You can also uh, talk about the end of life of an entity, like uh, if you talk about uh, a physical device or physical things that drop the glasses, they're broken, then that's the end of the li lifetime of the glasses. That's what we call invalidation. Um, and then we've got the ability of adding time information to some of those relations. Uh, time is really important. You want to talk about the point at which something was created, something was essentially deleted or invalidated, when something started, when something ended. We can add time information there. Uh, there is a bit of machinery that is necessary in order to do that. Um, we've got these notions of associations, but then how do you hook time information? That's why we've got association classes that are introduced there to which we add time information. It's a, technical, a technicality that only some of you are interested in. What is important to understand is that the UML diagrams that we introduced, that we defined in the standards, there was a strong push from, in, from some of the industry partners to have the UML diagrams, but they are not the normative aspect of the standards. They are there to illustrate the standards. The norm is a textual definition, and I will come to it in a few minutes. Uh, second component is about derivation, and an entity may have been derived from another entity. In addition, we've introduced sub-relations to that. We can say that uh, we, we've got a sub-relation which was that something was a revision of something else. Um, when you talk in, in, in um, open data journalism, you, in many contexts, you want to talk about the primary source of something, so we have a relation for that. Uh, or something was simply a quote from something else, so we've got a relation for that. And very often, underpinning a derivation is the fact that there was a process that created the derivation, and therefore we can hook in the data model an activity to that derivation. And then the third component, and I will stop with these components, uh, agents. An agent may be attributed, or sorry, an entity may be attributed to an agent. An activity may be associated with an agent, or an agent acted on behalf of another agent. And again, a few more extensions. In particular, something that some industry partners were really keen on, they were saying that if we just have a top-level definition of agent for responsibility, we are not going to have interoperability. We need something a bit more concrete. And therefore, we defined three subclasses of agents. We're not saying there may not be others, but these are three that we uh, define. A notion of organization, a notion of software agent, and a notion of person. And they turned out to be quite quite useful. Um, I will skip um, the, the remaining components for now. Um, as I was saying, standardization was really based on text, and therefore for each concept, for each class, for each relation, we came up with an English language definition. Um, and that's the pleasure of standardization. You cannot imagine the time it took in order to get one of those definitions agreed with 50 people. Okay? And what you can see here is that it conveys the intuition of what it is. A derivation is a transformation of an entity into another, an update of an entity resulting in a new one, or the construction of a new entity based on a pre-existing entity. Okay? And in terms of graphical representation, well, you can say that an entity 2 was derived from another entity 1, okay? 
And sometimes you may want to add extra information to that relation, okay? You may want to add subtypes or whatever, any information that you may find useful for your application. The way you do that is by introducing this intermediary resource that represents the derivation, and then you can uh, add extra attributes to that um, extra resource, okay? So, I've provided here the conceptual uh, definition of derivation, and syntactically, you can map it to whatever you want, one of those notations that we've introduced. Either you do it in RDF, you do it in XML, you do it in JSON, or you do it in a textual representation that we, we defined at the committee. But all of them are fully equivalent. For me, it's just a question of syntax, okay? Let me give you a couple more definitions. Generation is the completion of, a, of production of a new entity by an activity. It's a bit heavy, but it, what is important is what follows. This entity did not exist before generation and becomes available for usage after generation. That means that before generation, the entity is not there and therefore cannot have any influence on the rest of the system. It's only after it was generated and becomes used that it can influence other parts of the system. Uh, usage is the beginning of utilizing an entity by an activity. Before usage, the activity had not begun to utilize this entity and could not have been affected by the entity. So, this really highlights a temporal model associated with provenance because that generation, that usage, are points in time. And before that, there's not influence. After that, there can be influence. And these temporal notions have been sp specifically formalized in one of the documents that we call prof constraints, which is a set of constraints, temporal constraints, that good provenance should follow. And for instance, you don't want to say that I started, uh, I don't know, using something before it was created, okay? It doesn't make sense. Or you can't say that an activity ended before it started, okay? So all those constraints they allow us, allowed us to define a notion of valid provenance. All that is defined in the prof constraints document. In practice, there is a validator that is online. Dong will mention that very briefly later, with, um, that in which you can upload provenance and um, uh, have it checked, uh, whether it satisfies all um, the temporal constraints. Definition of attribution is the ascribing of an entity to an agent. Um, with this, I'm going to leave it to the introduction of the prof model because I want to spend some time, I want to move on to the third part, which is talking about provenance and its applications. Um, and the first thing I want to mention is this that if you are going to develop a system that produces provenance, inevitably you will end up with a lot of provenance. So from the start, you need to think about dealing with large volumes of provenance. And so we've defined a notion of provenance summarization. And I'd like to convey the intuition of a provenance summary. In real life, we um, somehow rely on past information, okay? Um, and um, if you take an example of a graduate school, a graduate school may admit students who've got first class degree from a good university, okay? Other graduate schools may say, actually, we would like to see what's happening before at college level, okay? so people may decide, depending on their policy, to go back into the past, more or less depending on their applications. Well, out of that idea, first we decided that how far you go into the past, you can abstract that as a parameter of the summarization. 
And second, we can say that two entities for which the past is the same up to a level k, we are going to regard them as equivalent because we can't distinguish them up to that point in the past, they are the same or they've got the same history. And based on that, we're going to say all entities with a similar path up to uh, a depth k, we're going to collapse them. And that results in a nice summarization algorithm. So that's a bit of provenance from the application, uh, the crowdsourcing application that Dong defined. Uh, you can't see it. Of course, it's too big. That's the point. The summary is the thing that appears in the, on the right. And for us, a provenance summary is itself a provenance graph with still those three concepts. We don't have agents of this specific one, but there is extra information. And you see here edges that are thicker than others. They represent the fact that a, derivation, uh, um, um, the, a relation like this one occurs very often in the original graph. Whereas one like this one is not frequent in the original graph. In other words, we've got a way of determining whether something is an outlier or whether it's a repeated pattern out of that provenance summarization technique. So it's a very powerful technique okay, to condense information in provenance graph. Uh, and what we found is that it's really useful in terms of analyzing the provenance. It's, there's, it's pointless to capture provenance if you don't make use of it. And for us, analytics is a key part of using provenance. A second strong purpose of, of provenance is being able to generate explanations. And somehow what I showed you with the National Climate Assessment Report, the narrative that was displayed was built out of that information model. And it's something that we are also doing at the moment in one of our research projects. So we are constructing narratives out of provenance. How does it work? Well, um, provenance, that record that uh, I've talked about today, for us, that's the foundation of explanations. How do we do that? You take a decision-making pipeline, you instrument it so that you produce provenance, you may summarize the provenance, extract the essence. Out of that, we've got a service that constructs explanations that are being provided to the users. And with the ICO, for those of you who are not from the UK, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, is the regulator for data privacy in the UK. We've been looking at, we've been building a prototype um, providing explanations for decision making in a loan making application and Dong will be talking about that application, that, that workflow early, uh, later in the presentation. And there is a report that is available from our website openprovenance.org describing that experiment. Uh, and what you can, we can do now is very simple. Out of um, some provenance on the left hand side, we can construct narrative. Here it's very very basic, we are translating each provenance expression into a sentence. But remember what I mentioned earlier? Those temporal constraints, now they tell us that we can order, uh, construct a partial order of, of um, provenance expressions that then we can use in order to construct a narrative. Now it needs to be abstracted and we are developing techniques in order to do that. So in terms of explanation, um, it's early days for the work we're doing. We're aiming at producing a kind of standalone service that can take provenance information and once it has been configured properly, would be able to produce explanations. But what we found is that if provenance is constructed 
properly with the right markup. And if it really describes properly what a system does, it can really help us in terms of generating explanations. And then, as I was saying, provenance for us is really critical in terms of analyzing that provenance so that it allows us to gain some insight about the system that generated that provenance. Um, I don't know, in, in, in the UK, the, the, the finance industry has, has that statement, a disclaimer. Past performance is not an indicator nor a guarantee of future performance, okay? Well, actually, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Can we learn from the past behavior of a system and potentially predict its, be its behavior? And what are we interested in predicting? Well, uh, remember, we were crowdsourcing data sets, those evacuation routes. Can we predict the quality of the data? The answer is yes, we managed to do it using the provenance. We're working with people uh, of the US Navy uh, using provenance in order to uh, describe the plans and the movement of automated um, uh, autonomous vehicle. Can we predict the behavior of autonomous vehicles out of provenance? That's something we're looking out also into. And likewise, predict the performance of people or the behavior of people in, in those systems. How do we do that? Well, here we're using a machine learning pipeline. Uh, the machine learning pipeline is uh, fairly traditional. Um, we've got initial provenance that we are going to use as a training set. Uh, we need some form of ground truth associated with that provenance, describing the ground truth up, uh, about the system. So in the case of this crowdsourcing, that was, is the data set of good quality or not? And then we use that, uh, <clears throat> we use that in order to, to train a model, and then we provide new, mod new, new, new provenance that has not been seen to a classifier, and we get the prediction. So it's fairly standard. Dong here can talk in details about the way we've done that. In the very first instance, it was fairly uh, simple, but very innovative at the time. We were using traditional network metrics on, on provenance graphs in order to essentially have a metrics to, 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 uh, to do the machine learning on. Some of the metrics are provenance specific. So for instance, a generic metric is the diameter of a graph. Uh, the provenance version is the distance between maximum distance between two entities, for instance, taking into account that we've got directed graphs, connected nodes that are types with edges of specific types. So let me tell you about a couple of applications we used uh, that machine learning for. We've got a repository of provenance where people submit provenance information. Actually, provenance is a language that you can use to describe what happened in a system. That language is going to be used differently by different people. What we've been able to do was to predict who the owner of provenance was, simply by recognizing the signature of the provenance graph as those metrics, simply because people have designed provenance in different ways. So that tells us two things. One is that it's quite interesting. The predictive capabilities are quite strong. Second is that when we record provenance, this may have privacy implications because you may, just out of the behavior, identify the people. But that's well known. Out of gate analysis, people, you know, researchers are identifying people uh, with specific gates. So it's not surprising that we can do that with provenance too, but I think that's something that we will need to investigate further. Uh, as I said, uh, we used this predictive modeling technique in order to predict the quality of the data that was being crowdsourced. And what we got is really high level 
levels of accuracy where we were able to uh, predict the quality of buildings up to 90%, of root sets up to 96%. And then we also worked with another application where um, we had participants who were receiving instructions on their mobile phones. And as part of the activity, we had GPS traces of, of, of where they were going and whatever they were doing, all their interactions over the phone. And so, <clears throat> What we did is, out of the behavior as locked in the form of provenance, we were able to predict with a high level of accuracy the instructions that were given to people. Okay? So, turn that on its head, you give instructions to people, you anticipate some behavior, you expect some behavior. Through provenance, we can detect whether the behavior is compatible with the orders, okay? So it's a good tool, potentially, in order to check compliance, okay? Um, so, where are we going with that? Well, that was the very early days. It was four years ago. Um, actually, after that, we learned that combining the summarization techniques and this um, uh, provenance network analytics we were getting much more, much better results. And then even more recently, uh, we started to develop provenance kernels that seem even more promising, so really powerful machine learning technique. Um, so, in summary, uh, analytics is, again, a very promising technique for us. So I've, I've been talking about um, summarizing, explaining, and machine learning out of provenance. And to us, these are really powerful tools that uh, allow us to enrich the, the behavior of application with this type of functionality. Um, there is a lot of infrastructure that we've developed, but Dong will say a few words about that. And I'm reaching the conclusion of my part. I started that by saying that we need to make systems more and more accountable. And I deeply believe that provenance is offering us a good way, a standardized way of describing what systems do. Um, it's still a challenge to produce provenance information. There are techniques that are being developed by, by us, but others as well. Um, but what is really interesting for us is to show that when you have provenance, you have really new things that you couldn't do otherwise. And that, I think, is, is a really, really powerful angle, in particular, explaining what a system does. And I've shown that, how, how we're starting to do, to do it now. So, a couple of minutes, if you have questions, and then we're gonna, I'm going to hand over to Dong um, shall I put up the slides, Dong? Yeah? Any question? Yes? Yeah, maybe you will be answering this now, I don't know, but it feels like it's really, really powerful, but I feel like one of the main uh, issues is the actual uh, creating the problem itself and uh, ultimately uh, and, uh, making sure that it's, I mean, even if you know, the problem itself is standardized through this yeah, model and everything, I mean, like you said, people will Yeah. So uh, um, I was asked to repeat the question, so I'll try to repeat the question. So it's recorded. So um, uh, it seems that its provenance is very powerful, but the challenge is to produce provenance um, because without it, we can't have all the benefits. Okay. So uh, I fully agree. Uh, and there needs to be more and more. So we've developed a number of tools and the community, there are lots of things out there. You know, uh, there are workflow systems that produce provenance automatically. What we're trying to do now is explain how to, uh, to in instrument machine learning pipelines so that provenance is also produced. Um, I, I co-supervised a PhD student showing and, and who did a nice piece of work 
if you've got a UML specification of an application, out of that he can generate provenance information automatically. But I agree, more is required. What we hope to do now is instill the, the technique to you on how to model provenance. That's what we're going to do now. So that at least you are aware of it and are able to, to model that in, in, um, in your own applications. Any other question? Yeah? So uh, have I had the opportunity to uh, use provenance in a context of business processes rather than systems processes and potentially help business community here? Uh, the short answer is no, I've not done it. Uh, I think there is, there is certainly something worth investigating. I do believe that they had, uh, a while back uh, before we standardized Prof, there was some work done at IBM on a notion of provenance before the standards related to business processes, and in particular they were using it at some people-like workflow language. Um, most workflow languages used by the scientific community would record some form of provenance, many would produce Prof, but um, I think the angle with business processes has not been developed much. No. Do you think that this particular framework could be, I mean, it appears the model is pretty generic in that sense. Do you believe it's extensible to apply to that space? Yes, so one thing I didn't say is that the, the, w w when we standardized, conscientiously we were domain agnostic because we we didn't want to be able to say to do something for the medical sector that wouldn't apply to me mechanical sector. Okay, so it's domain agnostic, and we explicitly show extension points in the data model so that you can subclass, subtype, subrelation uh, for specific domains. And it is my expectations that different application domains, communities in those domains, would standardize their own terms within the framework of PROVs. And we see that emerging. So the medical domain are, are doing a, a lot of that in, in the US um, in terms of uh, extending essentially the, the, the PROV conceptual model uh, with some of their terms. And I don't see any issue with doing that with the business, business processes. Okay, Dong, the slides are yours. Thank you. All right, so um, I, 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 we think that provenance is something that, uh, you know, like maybe you have one hour listening to a, a setup slide and then you go away and then you may, you know, forget about <laughs> what you've seen earlier. So we thought maybe having like a short time that uh, hopefully gets you do some work, <laughs> get, get you think about a number of questions uh, that relevant to, to the, 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 the context of um, the talk earlier. Uh, hopefully it will stay with you a bit longer. So the, the example that I would want you to look at is um, it's, it, it's the same scenario that we use uh, for explanations. So we uh, look uh, mentions the work that we did with the ICO in the UK to um, to look at different explanation requirement under GDPR. So somebody give you an automated decision, what sort of thing that you have to provide, what what kinds of answer you will need to provide to the data subject uh, under the GDPR. So in that work, um, we took a loan decision scenario. So, for example, you now like you go online, you apply for like credit card application, you just submit application, and then a few seconds later, you see like oh, you will get a credit card in the next three working days. Um, sorry, you will not get the card, or maybe somebody will come back to you at some point uh, to, to to talk about your application. So we sort of simulate a. a, a an automated 
decision for loan application. So uh, this is not to build the state of the art, you know, uh, fraud detections or you know credit check or whatever. It's just a very very simple thing. So imagine that you have some past loan data set. You know that okay, some of the loans uh, get repaid fully. Some of the loan, you know, you get a default. So, can you look at the properties of those past loan data set in order to predict when a new application come in at the other end? You will be able to tell that, okay, it, it, is it a good application to proceed? So, the one thing that we did there is that we took a loan data set online. We do a very traditional machine learning. You filtering the data to get what you want. You transform it in a way that it's suitable for a machine learning uh, pipeline to train and then use it. Uh, and then at the end, we get a, a, a classifier. Now, this classifier will have will make some significant decision, business decision that somebody may come back and ask you you know, why make that decision? How did you come up with this classifier? Uh, why it's biased? Like you've seen perhaps the news on Apple uh, <laughs> credit card. Why is it give, give the, the, the female applicants less credit than, than, than male uh, applicants? So I know that there's a lot of questions that we cannot answer by using just the provenance. but. Imagine if a regulator come to you and ask, okay, how can you explain me? How do you get to that classifier to, to make those decisions? So this is the part that, that, that we want you to think about, how to describe that step-by-step -step process or workflow in order to explain that using the vocabulary that we showed earlier. So to remind you and to help you with the thinking, so. First, we want to think about the data. So in, in this system, the data flows. You have something coming in, something coming out. So at each box there, what are the inputs? What are the outputs? Uh, is there any dependencies between the output from the input? So sometimes you, you have input that doesn't have any you know, bearings on the outcome. Um, then you want to think about, so what is the box does? Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and what happened, essentially the, the question is what happened and when. And this is more about telling who responsible for which concepts, which, 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 which elements in, in your documentation. So you imagine that you describe the provenance of a pipeline or any process as the way like you code and then you document. You, 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 you provide a document of this is the step that I'm going through, this is who changed it. And then so if you go to GitHub, you know, you know who changed this file, what, it, what was changed. So provenance model is essentially a more generic model to describe that. Um, there are uh, some general um, questions that we need to think about most of the time. Uh, I show you blobs, or, you know, like hexagon, uh, rectangles, ellipses there. How do you refer to them? Um, you know, it, it's, it's meant to be a precise record of what happened. So what do you call, how do you refer to a data set? How do you name it? Uh, what happened if somebody named your, your data set you know, in the same way? You know, whether, how do you distinguish between the two things? Um, and then in Xbox here, that I don't show, but for, ex for example, for that entity, you want to talk about, you know, what are the properties of that, prop uh, that entity? So think about the attributes. Um, what I'm going to provide you with is small handouts that remind you with the, 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 the core vocabulary we have. Um, I just want to add one more thing is that we want to show, we want to have a consistent way to read the diagram. So we just ask people to follow the timeline, um, um, you know, like from past to present. So one thing that worth to mention is the, um, the relations in, 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 in the prof data model always point back to the past. So 
something was derived from another thing, an activity used an entity. So the entity must be uh, must exist before it gets used. So we, if you if you want, you can do it vertically like that, or you can do it horizontally. But if we stick with one uh, convention, that it's easier for all of us to read. Um, okay, uh, maybe we we want to uh, to make into small groups of three, four people. Can you self-organize and join your um, colleagues? <laughs> okay. Yes. So, so the bit of the provenance modeling essentially, um, essentially, take the start. So you have a lone data set. Can you draw out some of the entities and the activities that do the data filtering, and then go on until you get you reach the classifier? And we will be around the room to uh, help you and answer your questions. OK? Do you have any questions now before we start? OK. So let's um, spend the next uh, 10 minutes uh, to 10, 15 minutes to think about these things. And uh, we come back and show you the uh, solutions, <laughs> the answer. Yeah. Okay, you may want to think about what you're finishing with, data or, or, or whatever, and then think about intermediary step and the kind of flow of data you may have in the system. Okay, and then after that you can add activities to describe what's happening in those derivation. So, what are you starting with here? Just a hint, you're starting with that. Okay. <laughs> There's nothing to regret. <laughs> it's about experimenting. <laughs> Sorry. Processes are here? No, it's not here. No, it's provenance here. So you would have you would start your your past loan data set would be an entity. That's yes, correct. But yeah. how, where was it derived from or where was yeah. that? Do we start well, but, uh, so we're not going to go back to the Big Bang. Uh, Maybe uh, that's the start uh, of your story. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. At, at some point you have to, well, for, it's not that you have to, but you don't necessarily have the, the information. Yeah. Okay. It may have been given to you. Maybe yeah, it's attributed okay. to Bob. Okay. Yeah. yeah. On, on, on the questions, you have to open up the box a bit more or a bit less, okay? So it depends on what you want to do ultimately. There is no right answer to that. Hi. We had quite a few interesting questions. Uh, so I, I think, uh, can, can I get your attention, please? So I think, I think, you you touch through the, uh, the, the 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 requirements. Say okay, you need to describe the the journey from the data set to the classifier, and you ask a lot of questions how to do this and how we you know link these two things together. So these are the questions that we ask all the time when we try to model provenance, and I appreciate that it's such a short time we cannot do the whole thing, but I thought um, I would show you. The 
uh, the, the, the modeling that I did for that application, and I will go through them. If you have quick questions, just stop me and ask, and I will tell you why it, it worked it that way. Um, the final thing I want to mention is that we have the material online. So I have an iPython notebook that essentially go through the whole pipeline that you've seen. And, and I use like the pro Python to capture the, this provenance. So this is provenance I don't draw by hand. So it's captured by, by going through those steps. So we start at the beginning with a data set. So I call it Phi Landing Club. And it has the Phi name. I use that to in a process called filtering the data. So when I filter the data, um, I use um, it's scikit-learn and pandas, and you filter the data in memory. But what I did there is that because I want to describe the provenance of the filtering, and maybe later I want to tell the people that these are the data that I filter and I use. So I save it to a file called loans filter. So this file loan filter is an entity that was derived by that from, from the original data set. And this is the activity. The activity is here. The property is fairly simple. The start time, the end time. Sorry, it's a bit too, um, too small maybe for you to see from afar. And I also say, tell that this is the, I'm selecting the data. This is the type of this activity. Now, there's two agents in this whole process. So we have a staff, you have a staff ID. This ta staff is a person and a data engineer. So we could tell what, what kinds of like agent that is. And he is responsible for this activity. Right, now we have a new entity generated from this activity. And we also attribute the creation of this, um, this, this entity to that staff. That staff did all this thing, but his is this not his personal responsibility. He did all these things on behalf of the company that he worked for, his employer. So you could describe that acted on behalf link to, to the employer, and later you can have a query, a graph query, to say who is responsible for this loan filter, and then you can go back all those links. Um, I will go a bit quicker. So the next time you have data transformation, you know that you filter some data to the one that you need. You need to transform it for the, the loan, uh, sorry, the uh, machine learning to take into. Uh, it's simple. It, it's the same process. That file loan filter you have in the previous line, you derive, you, you create a new called loan process with uh, I think I store some of the numbers here. So here you have the numbers of columns in this table is 31. After the transformation, it's 123. For example, so you can add more attributes to those entities. And all these, um, it's called um, activity pre-processing. Generate this, and this attributed to, to the, the staff, yes. Yes, uh, you you could. Uh, so uh, as I said earlier, on on this side, the the, the pictures that you have in front of you, it's it's a set of words, it's concept, and and relation. So these are vocabulary that you use. So you could start with just say, the classifiers was derived from the initial data set without any of those details. So in this case, we go into a little bit more details, and we can answer some different questions. So questions about how data was filtered, how data was transformed. And if you want to enter, go to the, the columns and row level, if you have the business or application requirement for that, we, we can do that as well. Um, maybe to add that the database community has been interested in this question for many years, where you can talk about the provenance of a row, of a table, or a cell. Okay, uh, And th there are solutions. Yes. <coughs> Right, so the next step, it's called machine learning. But actually, that box machine learning has several things that happen in, 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 in between as well. So now we have, we have the, I think I missed one. But anyway, I'll go on. Um, so you have that, you have the loan process here. 
So the data engineer will decide to split them into half, one to use for the training and one for you to the testing. Uh, and it has different numbers of rows here. And I also, for its files here, I record the, um, the hash. So later, it's more like for you to verify, actually, is it the, the same thing that you're talking about? The train data set was used to train and create a Python object with the type called scikit-learn pipeline. And that scikit-learn pipeline go through the validating process using the test, and then it generates a score, accuracy score, like 80% here, um, and all that attribute to the uh, data engineer. So the, now the next step in, in our scenario is that it's not the, it's only the, the data engineer. The data engineer create the pipeline, but then a manager will need to look into all the validations and see whether is it, is it okay for us to deploy it in real life. And I simplify uh, lots of the details, but essentially the ma there's something called a, a, di a different staff with the role of a manager. He or she look at the uh, score, the accuracy score here, and then approve that object, that, that pipeline object, and then uh, deploy it in the real world called Lone Pipeline 1, where actually that where you can go and see the profile and ask. And there's a record generated with the signatures of the manager to keep track of the process that this has been done. Um, connect them all together, you have something starting all the way like that, so you have the, the sort of like the, the traces or the audit trail history, you can go back and then answer questions about who responsible for what, which data was selected, which, which was not included, uh, and, and, and so on. And we, <coughs> we use this in the demonstrator in, that was linked on the, um, the material website where you can go and have a look and uh, see you know, the explanation that we generate from, from the <coughs> application. Okay. Okay, so I think we've reached the end of our session. Um, I hope you, you found this useful. It's it's a very brief introduction. Normally, a tutorial lasts a whole day, but we just had uh, an hour and a half. But at least I hope that you've learned enough of, of the ideas to realize that it's, it's really important, it's useful to have provenance, and you've got a number of, of pointers for to documents and examples and don't be afraid of contacting us if if you've got any questions or you don't know how to proceed we can assist you okay um, i think with this we will complete the formal recording and we're happy to take further questions if you want to <laughs>